Well, good morning. I want to begin our series. You can open your Bibles to two places, uh, John chapter 1 and then 1 John chapter 4. 1 John is just a couple uh, pages before you get to the book of Revelation in the end. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, we'll spend most of our time there. But John chapter 1 and 1 John 4. Is it possible, is it possible to know, to absolutely know, that the God who created you loves you? Is it possible to know that you know, that you know, that you know that God loves you? The answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. It's emphatically yes. It's in every possible way yes. And if anybody wondered this morning whether or not you could know that you know that you know that you know that God loves you, the answer is yes. He did not want to hide it. He has never wanted to hide that. He's wanted to make it as clear as he possibly could. And even as we talk about Christmas, as we talk about the Christmas story, you will find that the story itself is an expression of God's clarity of how he feels about you. In fact, how he feels about the whole world. The question for us constantly is, but have I received his love for me? That's our question this morning. But the answer to your question, maybe you have it, is it possible to know, is emphatically yes. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the incarnation. We're going to talk about uh, Jesus coming, God the Son coming in the flesh to live among us, to give his life for us, to rise again, and to change our hopes and our futures for all humanity. That's what the story is about Usually we'll read out of Matthew or, or Luke's Gospels because there are four stories about the, the life and teachings of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell the story of Jesus. They have different audiences in mind as they're telling their story. Matthew and Luke, though, give you some of those classic verses that talk about Joseph's perspective, meeting an angel saying, your, uh, your fiance is pregnant and, and don't worry, this is my doing. Uh, Okay, how many of you, if you were engaged, you would need God to really be clear that that was his doing, because uh, if it wasn't your doing, uh, this is not going to work out. Are you with me? So that's what Matthew tells us. Luke gives us the perspective from Mary's understanding is she has an encounter with an angel and says, hey, listen, hey, Mary, you've been chosen and this is going to happen. Um, and this is what the Holy Spirit's going to do to make it happen. Um, and, and, you know, essentially... Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll put a good word in for you with Joseph. He, he actually doesn't promise her that, but thankfully he does. But John takes a different approach to telling the story. Instead of starting on earth, what's happening here, he takes us all the way outside 10,000 foot view from heaven's view. And he presents Jesus first as this all-powerful, ever-present all-knowing God who descends or condescends into our world in the flesh. I want to read those verses just because this is where we get the word incarnation from. It just means in the flesh. I'll read those verses and then we're going to take a look at 1 John chapter 4 where he continues a conversation to the churches that he's writing to, helping them understand the significance of of God, his love, and how he has expressed it to them in no uncertain terms. This is how God feels about you, and this is how you can know, and that's what he says. But here's what John does. John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In flesh, the word became flesh. 
It's the Latin, the Latin term is where we get the word, or incarnate is where we get the root word for incarnation. He said, God became flesh. And we have this manger up here for this series just to remind us that obviously didn't look like this particular manger. This one looks probably a lot nicer than the one he had. Um, Probably stone and very cold. But here, this manger is very nice and it reminds us that God left all of that. He emptied himself, Paul says, and took on human flesh and was born in a manger. That's a game-changing statement. It is the one time. In theology, we talk about the immutability of God. That means God does not change. He cannot change. He will not change. He does not change. He's the same. But there is one time in history where God changed. And this is that time. He took on flesh. Now God the Son, Jesus, will never not be fully God and fully human. He changed. He became like us. And he ever will be like us. It's a big deal. It's massive. And it's a truth. We talk about it a lot at Christmas. It's a truth that absolutely undergirds everything about our faith. And it's huge because all year long, you will find a world that is trying to erode that reality for you or for the people that you love. Is indeed Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Did he really come in the flesh? Is he fully God and yet fully man? Does he understand why would he do all of that? The answer is because he loves. That's the answer. It'll come out really clear here in a minute. Because he loves us, But the reality is this, the love of God being born in your heart gives you the capacity to love in a way you could never love. You cannot just love. The kind of love the Bible is going to talk about in a minute here, we call it agape love. There's four words for love in the Greek, but this particular word, it's the only way that John talks about love. He uses only that word to talk about it. He says, in this particular kind of love, The only way that comes through my life is not by me trying to do it or trying harder or figuring it out. It is because God is born in me. Just like Jesus was born in a manger, when he comes into my life, he gets born in me and I get born again. John is where we get that phrase. He talks about it in John chapter three. You must be born again. That is the only way for the life of God that he came to give you to be found in your life and therefore his love to go through you. So three things I wanna talk about today is that love gives life. In 1 John 4, we're gonna realize this, that love gives life. At the end of the day, the goal is life, that you might have life, that you might have it to the full. Why did Jesus come? What does love do? The net effect of love in my life and in your life and in our life and in our world is that people might know life. And if I forget to say it later, I'm going to say it now. Eternal life doesn't mean future life. Eternal life means unending life. It's eternal. That means it starts now and it continues. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full or have it more abundantly. That's what love does. Love's desire is that you and I would know life, know it to its full. Secondly, love initiates good. Love doesn't sit on its hands and wait for you to say, hey, uh, if you do something nice for me, I'll do something nice for you. And I will continue to do nice things for you if you continue to do nice things for me. But if you don't do nice things for me, I will stop doing nice things for you. That is how the world loves, and it's a way lesser version of love. And anybody can do that. But the kind of love that God has and has shown us and has done in us is the kind of love that just initiates good, always goes first, pursues and doesn't stop. And then thirdly and quickly, we'll talk about how love can be incarnated through you or is intended to be incarnated in my own life. I am supposed to represent or I have the capacity because of Jesus to have love and to be love in the flesh. Jesus literally is love in the flesh. So, 1 John chapter 4, let's read verse 9. Uh, I'll actually, let me read the whole passage, and then I'll break it down in this. Let me, in verse 7 first. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born. Say born. Of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God or does not love does not know God because God is love. He is love. It's not just an attribute. Now, it's important that we take a moment to say that because we know that God is just and God is this and God is a lot of things that God is. But here, John is helping us to know two things, that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all and that God is love. And these two things, these are defining attributes that every other thing we know about God filter through. Yes, he's just, but because he loves Yes, he's just, but because he is light, he is righteous, and in him there is no evil at all. Yes, he does these things. Yes, he is these ways in my life, but the motivation for all of it is because he loves. Yes, he disciplines, but that's because he loves. Yes, because he loves. He creates because he loves. This is an attribute of who he is. This is like the essence of who God is. God is love. And in this, I'm sorry, God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that he sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, meaning the Father, because he's spirit. But if we love one another, guess what? God abides in us, he lives in us, and his love is perfected in us, or made complete is the word in the Greek. This is what we're talking about today. So first, love gives life. In verse 9, he says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. I started with a question, is it possible to know that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know that God loves you? And the answer emphatically is yes. And John goes back to this moment that we talk about at Christmas time, this event of Jesus coming in the flesh, why he came, and he explains that God's love was expressed to all the world in this moment, in this act. In this, the love of God was made manifest. The word manifest means seen. Something that, it's a concept, it's an idea that you can't see, all of a sudden is seen. Like if I said, hey, um, I, okay, so if I told my wife, hey babe, you know, uh, you know I love you. I don't need to say it. I don't need to show you that I love you. Just, Just know that. We're married 22 years now. Um, She's at a a, uh, tournament with my son uh, for lacrosse. But if she was here and I'd be staring at her right there and I'd say, hey, babe, is that that enough? I told you once and that's all you need to know. (laughs) It's 22 years ago, but, you know, I'm still here. The answer is no. It's invisible, but it needs to be manifested. Our love for people has to have an expression for them to actually know it's real. And he says, listen, God's love was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. The goal of love is seeing others live. Come alive, thrive. That's the goal of love. If you understand that, then think then for a moment about what is God's intention for your life. It's that you would thrive, that you would be alive, like fully alive. The question is, did he have to come for that to be your reality? Because there's a lot of folks say, I'm doing just fine on my own. I don't, I, didn't, I don't need it. I don't need him. I don't need that. What they don't understand is the situation that we're all in. The Bible paints a picture of the situation that we're in. In fact, later on in chapter 5, he literally, John will literally say, the whole world is under the power of the devil. You've got to understand the circumstances of our world. Ever since the fall, because of sin, the Bible says the wages of sin or the payment of sin, sin always leads and only leads to death. Death in your relationships, death in your spirit, separation from God was the original problem. And that's still the problem for those that don't know the Lord. 
separation or death in your marriage, death to circumstances, death to your finances, in every area of your life, if you want to continue walking in your own way, the wages of sin is always death. The problem is I enjoy walking in my own way. Anybody else like me? I love, my, I love to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I just, you know, it's great. And that's the problem of our entire world. We're all doing what we want to do when we want to do it. The problem is it just begets death in our lives instead of the life that he intended for you. Now listen, there are some who don't want it. I don't want Jesus and I don't want the life he came to bring, but at least you've got to understand it. You're making that choice on your own. If you want to know what God thinks about you, he thinks you're amazing. He thinks you're worth dying for. He thinks you're worth rescuing. He thinks you're worth leaving heaven to come to earth for. He thinks you're worth taking on the insults of mankind for. He thinks you're worth every last bit of it. That's what he thinks about you. Because he intended you to live. Not just in eternity, but yes, in eternity. When we accept Christ, the one who came, this baby born in the manger, into our lives, when we say, Jesus, I will put my faith in you because I need you, because I sinned, and I fall short of a perfect God who is light, who is perfect, who is perfection, I'm not measuring up in a lot of areas of my life. But instead of trying harder and doing more and working my way to God like every other religion in the world will teach you, it's man's attempt to get somewhere. The Bible, uh, the Christianity and the Bible teach completely opposite. Instead of us trying to get to somebody, trying to get somewhere, trying to reach enlightenment, Jesus, God, the word came to us in our mess and said, I'm the answer. I'm the only way that you'll get there. But my intention, my why, is that you might live, that you might have life. The enemy has tried so hard to teach a generation, and some of us even in the room today, some watching online, that God's intention for us is somehow less than that he wants you to live and to know life and to become everything he created you to be. And because we're so twisted in our thinking about God, we say, I don't know about this, God. I don't know about all that. I'm not sure I want all of that from my life. But if you understood the heart of God for you, that he just wants you to live, to live to the full, to know joy, to know life now and forevermore, well, then it's hard to resist that kind of love. That's why the enemy tries so hard to keep it from your heart and from your eyes. For God so loved the world, John says in chapter 3, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. And that's the exact lie of the enemy. One, it's that he's not the son of God. Two, it's that anything related to Jesus and God and all of that is that he would condemn you and make you feel like a lousy, lousy person. No, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came to save it on a rescue mission. That was his heart, because you're worth it. But that the world might be saved through him. I love the story of uh, the Peters and what they shared, what Reina's Hope is doing down in Chiapas, Mexico, in that area, because the whole intention of that is love being manifest. The whole intention of this is that these young gals might understand life that they might experience life. That's what love does. I want you to know who you are. I want you to thrive. I want you to know God's love for you. I want you to know your identity, who you really are. Not everything the world has said about you. Not the experiences of your past. I want you to know better than that, how God sees you. You're worthy. You're worth it. Now listen, if those gals say, I don't want to live there, that would be their choice. But the heart, it would be crazy to say no. The heart is, we just want to love you. We created a space for you, a place for you, a home for you to come and live and to thrive and to become and to know family and to know life and to discover your gifts and your abilities and your talents, to understand who, the, who God is who made you so that you might live now and live forever. Now that is so compelling. Why would they want to say no to that? 
But yet some say no every single day. But that's why we tell the story. That's why we need him to be born in our hearts so we can love like that, so people can experience that love to your life. Whether it's something like this or some other way, love intends and must be manifest through my life. I love this second point that John says. Love initiates good. It initiates. I love the way he says this. It's so kind of unique. He says, in this is love. Let's pause. Okay, what is it? Not that we have loved God. He said, in this is love. It has nothing to do with your response. Let's just stop for a minute. You want to understand love? Don't look at the response. Look at what was initiated. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. You want to understand love? He loved you, and he came to you. It's not about your response. It's the fact that he sought you out. He initiates good. He doesn't stop. He sought you out. He came to the earth. He's been pursuing you. For some of you, you got to know this. This day is like one day in like a, a thousands and thousands of days of God pursuing, knowing you were coming, saying, I'm in it for you. I'm after you. You are the object of my affection. I'm after you. I'm in it for you. He initiated. That's a crazy thought to me. See, the way the world loves, the way we love, is we, we reciprocate love. It kind of goes back and forth. And, it, you know, if somebody stops initiating love for us, well, we kind of stop initiating love back. Are they going to buy me a gift this year? <laughs> eh, well, then I got to buy them a gift. This is what he says. That's not love. You're going into it with, oh, I'm obligated. I got to buy a gift for them now. I wish they never bought me a gift. So I wouldn't have to buy them a gift. Anybody with me? It's not just obligated love. It's like, do I have to send them a card? Oh, they sent, oh, they sent us a card. Oh, great. Get the address book out. We're going to have to do, order a few more. We got a few cards we weren't intending now. We got to send them a card. He says, that's not love. It's not our response. It's the fact that he sends you a card. That he buys you a gift. He's not expecting a return. He's just saying, I love you. And if we see his love in that, that he came in the flesh. God is love. And he came in the flesh to manifest his love for you. Not that you loved him, but he came for you. And he says, even more crazy, verse John 4 said this, we love because he first loved us. He went first. Initiating means I go first. And I go first. And I go first. And I keep going first. Despite which, I still go first. But Romans 5, Paul says something that is like, Pow! for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Uh, perhaps for a good person, one might even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He said it's, it was demonstrated. It was shown. It wasn't that he did it after you cleaned yourself up. After you dressed up nice and said, ah, I'll start taking this kind of serious. Maybe I'll go to church on a Sunday. Maybe I'll do. It wasn't after that as a response to you. It was while you were still saying, F you, God. I don't want anything to do with you. I want to live my own life. I, I don't need a God in my life. I don't, Christmas is for, is for, I don't know, it's for children. When you were still doing what you wanted to do as you wanted to do it, as often as you wanted to do it, while you were still sinning, he said, I'm going to die for you anyways. While they were nailing him to the cross and the, and, and the religious leaders were mocking him, saying, hey, come on off that cross. If you're something, he, he did it anyways. He loved them anyways. While the Romans were putting spikes in his hand, he loved them anyways. It was for all of them, for all of the world. In chapter two of 1 John, he says, he died for all the world, the entire world, throughout history. He pursued you when you wanted nothing to do with him. 
That's how ridiculous God's love is. That's why it's a different kind of love. That is not the kind of love that is natural for me. Natural love for me is the conditional kind of, it's Santa's kind of love. (laughs) Have you been naughty or nice? You get gifts if you've been what? Nice. And if you're naughty, what do you get? Cool. A lot of people think that's how God loves. They think that's how it works with God. If I'm nice, then he gives me good stuff. And if I'm naughty, the bad stuff means I was naughty. If stuff happens in my life that isn't good, therefore, I must have been naughty. God's love is unconditional, and that's what makes it so ridiculous. Lastly, John says, love can be incarnated through you. The sum of all of this and what he's telling the church is, listen, you can see God's love. It was manifest in what he did for you. His desire is only life and he initiates doing you good. It's a different kind of love. And if he's been born in you and his whole letter to the church that he's writing is talking about the difference of of those who demonstrate God coming through their life and those that don't. And he says, listen, it's either happening or it isn't. You can't fake it with God. Religion stinks is what, in John's words, he's not using that word, but religion is stupid. He says you can pick apart a false teacher uh, and a false prophet. You can pick all these things apart by just looking at what is coming out of their life. And he says, listen, if God has been born in you, and he uses that word born over and over and over and over again in John, because this is the picture It's the manger. He came in the flesh. He was born in a manger. And John tells Nicodemus in chapter three of John that he's gotta be born in you. If you're gonna know him, if you're gonna see and experience the life that God has for you, you've gotta be born again. He's gotta be born in your life. Now, if he's born in your life, listen, here's the effects. You're not gonna go on loving the sin. You're gonna start hating it. It's just, you just can't. They don't go hand in hand. You can't practice sin and love that and have the, 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 the God of righteousness in your heart. It doesn't work like that. You might wrestle with it, but you want to run from it rather than run to it. The other effect is you're going to love your neighbor. You're going to love your brother. You're going to love the people in the body of Christ. You're going to love people outside the body of Christ. Why? Because he... Love in the flesh has been born in the manger of your own heart. The effect is you're going to love one another. That's how it's going to happen. It's going to come out of you. But he says there's no other way. You cannot pretend that kind of love, this kind of love, this initiating good only always kind of love for people, this kind of I'm only in it that you would live and thrive and to see others strive is like the joy of my life kind of love. You're not going to be able to give that kind of love unless he's born in you. You'll give conditional love. You'll give different forms. You'll give lesser versions of love. But you won't be able to give that kind of love, especially to those that don't deserve it in your eyes. Remember, you didn't deserve it, and he loved you. Oh, yeah. Well, for those in your life that don't deserve it, eh, you're going to have a hard time loving them, unless it's his love coming through you. And here's what he says, beloved, If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Right now we're talking a lot about cell phones because all the cell phone deals are out, right? 5G this, 5G that, AT&T. Uh, Verizon, all the deals are out. iPhone 13s are out. Swap it out. Come get our new phones. There's a lot going on about 5G. How many of you can see 5G? Can you see it? Where's the, five, where's the, where's the 5G at? It's, a, it's around here somewhere. I know it is, 5G. It's there. Sad. 5G's invisible until... You receive it on your phone. 
Then you see the effects of 5G right there on your phone, right? You see the little bars. I got bars. Can you hear me now? Uh, you got the bars going on your phone all of a sudden. But how many of you know that all of us have a setting on our phone called airplane mode? And what's that intended to do? Block the 5G. We want to block the 5G, invisible things going on. We want to, we want to keep it from, from registering. And the enemy would love for your heart to stay on airplane mode for the rest of your life. And this love that God wants to come and, and bring into your own life that will cause you to live, that will cause you to live, he'd love to keep that blocked off. Why would we block it? I don't know because we don't understand how much God loves us. We don't know if he really does love us. Maybe we don't know what his intentions are for us. But if you understood, he already told you. He'll say yes. He'll say yes. He will check the box if you want a relationship with him. You know, check the box, yes or no. He already checked the box, yes. He already asked you to the dance. He already said yes to your friend request, your date request, you name it. He already said yes. You don't have to wonder from his end if he'll receive you. He already said yes. That's the message. The question is, will you take your heart off of airplane mode and let his love register in you? Let the Son of God be born in your life again by the Holy Spirit. One day, Jesus will come back and live on this earth. But until he comes back a second time, he said, I've given you my spirit. The very next verse, verse 13, says, how do we know this? Because he's given us of his spirit. The Spirit of God wants to come and bring life right there to your heart. Cause the love of God manifest in Jesus and what he came to do by giving his own life for you and me caused that to become your new reality. The question is, will we say yes to him and yes to that? And it's a choice we all get to make. I'm grateful that I said yes early on in my life. Never regretted a day. Never regretted a day. Many in this room have said yes. Many people you know have said yes. My greatest desire these days is just that his love can be manifest in my own life. That I can love a little better. More like God's kind of love and not like Brian's kind of love. But I need him in me to do that. Would you stand with me? Have you received... God's love this Christmas or last Christmas or any Christmas in the past? Have you said yes? Have you taken your heart off airplane mode? Maybe you wondered about him, his thoughts toward you, his intentions for you, and I hope just this one place in scripture, and there's so much more, can break through the questions that you might have had coming into this season. The answer is yes, he loves you. He's crazy about you. He loved you before. He'll love you after. But will you receive him? We're going to sing a song here, a couple songs. Give us a little bit of time just to let this settle in. My living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. That's all he wants to do is set you free. Can you say hallelujah because he set you free? And if not yet, today that can be your reality. Death has lost its grip on me. If that's not true, today that can become your reality. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. That is exactly what he came to do those years ago, that's exactly what he wants to do today. That can be your reality. And as we close our service and our time together this morning, I will give you an opportunity to just receive, to take the heart off of airplane mode. So this is our time as a church. Maybe individually you're going, hey, Lord, I, I haven't been loving like that lately. 
I need to say yes to you again. Holy Spirit, I, I want to love like that. I've been a little harsh with some people. I've been the reciprocal kind of love, a lesser version, not your kind. But you do a new work in me. I want you born in my heart. I want this fresh love. Let's take some time, respond to these, and, and I'll come and pray with you in a little bit. Jesus is a living hope. And that's his desire, it's his gift at Christmas for every one of us and certainly for those this morning. But like every gift, it has to be opened. It can be purchased, it can be wrapped, it can look amazing. It can even be offered, but it's not a gift until it's opened. It just remains in a box. And God's love wasn't meant to be in a box. It was meant to be opened right there in your heart. Would you bow your heads with me? I was just gonna lead us in a prayer. This morning is an opportunity for some of us to open a box that's been sitting there for a long time. You've known about it. You've thought about it. It's been sitting there. And today is your day. And the Holy Spirit's just saying, I'm after you. Let's just take one step at a time. But it starts by saying yes to me, to receiving the gift of love I've come to bring you, letting me remove guilt, shame, Letting me remove and heal past and memories. Letting me restore and bring about the fullness of who I created you to be. Letting my voice get through to your heart and tell you how much I love you and how much I think about you. And if that's where you're at this morning and you want to receive that gift, would you put a hand up where you're at? I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to give you an opportunity to acknowledge that that's a gift you want to open today. Just all across the place, just lift a hand up. Great. Who else? Anybody else? Okay. Anybody else want to open a gift? Open that gift from Jesus today. Even you online. Okay, great. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, awesome. Anybody else? Even online, just where you're at, if you're watching, just in your home, just slip a hand up. Just going to pray a simple prayer. If you mean it in your heart, just join me in the prayer. And then afterward, we give opportunity for prayer, all needs, whatever it is. We have a team here that will come and pray with you, who will just walk with you, that just solidify this decision you've made today. So God, this morning, we hear you and we respond. That simple. You said you love us. You've demonstrated that you love me. Jesus, you came to this earth. You took on flesh. You demonstrated your love for me. You gave your life for me. You took my sins upon yourself so that I could know you and have a relationship with God again. You pursued me when I wasn't pursuing you. Everything about your love this morning is irresistible. And so I make a choice to open my heart to you and to invite you to come into my own heart, to be my Lord, to be the Savior that I needed. I need it. I need it. So come in today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need prayer for anything this season, Our prayer team will be here to pray with you. God bless you today, this week, as you go. It's our chance to incarnate God's love. Amen? All week, all year, let God bring it, bring it up, bring it in. Let him do it through you. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week.